what we're doing here with these little guys, um, these are all captive bred white-tailed deer fawns. And what we're doing is we're, we're bottle feeding. We, we remove them from their mothers, primarily for the reasons we want to keep them tame. Because I mean, as many of you guys know, white-tailed deer are very, very flighty by instinct. And when we're trying to work them as adults, the chances of them injuring themselves are, are very great if they're wild and they're running around and they're bounced off the fences and stuff. So we found if we bottle feed them, it makes it easier to work them when they're adults. And uh, it's also I mean, an enjoyable thing to do for, I mean, a lot of the neighbor kids come out and help us. And it kind of gives us some good PR with the, the yeah. people around us that people come back constantly and are helping us do this. And, um, it, it's, I mean, it's a, a definitely a double thing where the deer are easier to work with when they're older and they're less likely to get hurt when we're working with them. Um, our primary part of the, the deer operation is we, we sell deer scent and uh, deer attractant to, to hunters. So we're bottling uh, the deer urine. I'll take you up to the, the urine collection facility and I'll show you how that all works. But uh, to work through the system, these does need to be pretty tame so they don't make each other scared. And deer that are under stress are, are harder, or they're not collecting as good of a product. Okay, that's 27, 26. All right, babe. So do certain ones get certain bottles? Yeah, yeah, they're all, right now at this age, they're all at different ages because they weren't born on the same day. So progressively, more and more, so the yellow tags are all older fawns. The 20 set, Twix 26 and 27 are a little bit younger than they are. 30 and 32 are a little bit younger than 36 is the youngest one in here. So they all have different volumes. And right now, the, the oldest ones are three weeks with the yellow tags and they're at around nine ounces. And this youngest one is at like six and a half. But uh, we've got two others in this in the next stall in there that are just starting on the bottle this morning. I'm gonna take care of them in a little while. Usually once you take them off their mom, you give them about 12 to 18 hours without milk. And because when they take them from the mom, they're really kind of upset about it. And they just, they pout and they make mad faces and they, they just don't want to take a bottle at all. But after then it's just like, all right, I'm too hungry to even care that you're not mom. And then they get right on the bottle. 32 has not had one. Her, her green bottle is in here. So how much do you feed them a day? Right now they are on uh, three time a day feedings. Um, when they first start out, it starts out at six times a day, uh, two ounces at a time. And then we feed them, uh, well then they go down to four times a day. And then you're, you're just basically, we're, we're breaking it down so they're getting more volume and less feedings at a time. So one it's not as crazy on our schedule i mean the, the six time a day feedings are there's a one o'clock feeding and then a five o'clock feeding so that that gets pretty uh pretty tiring after that first two weeks but as they get to this age i mean they're pretty easy to take care of and and i mean they're a lot of fun to to do this and what kind of formula are you well, originally we started, we fed them a, uh, a goat milk replacer. Easy. Who's this guy? Uh, that goes to 32. Or 32. Let's see. 30 has not probably eaten. I, yeah, that's her bottle too. Um, it originally we used uh, Land of Lakes goat milk replacer because they didn't make anything specifically for deer. That was about uh, four years ago. Now there's a company called Zoologic that makes an actual doe milk replacer. So they, uh, it's more balanced specifically for what the protein intake and the, and the fat content intake that, that deer need. And something I don't know if this is 100% true, somebody told me this, that deer are lactose intolerant, so they can't handle uh, dairy milk from like beef or from dairy cows. So we have fed real goat's milk in the past too. We'll buy the goat's milk when we can get it and feed that. But anyway, buying a, a real goat's milk is so expensive that when we're feeding 17 of them, it, <laughs> it that's, that kind of hits the wallet pretty hard when it's $6, $8 a gallon. Yeah. So now how long will you hand feed them like this? We'll hand feed these guys. Um, 
about 12 weeks is what they would usually say you usually say so like three months is when that's, they're gonna be on the bottle usually i'll may do another four weeks on top of that just like one time a day because i just want them to stay nice and calm and uh and kind of remember who takes care of them once they get moved out to the to the big pen um we'll just be, it's it's not a big deal usually then i mean you just come out in the morning give them their bottle and it's more just a social time for them than than anything else and i do think it gives them a little bit extra boost because bottle fawns are i mean not being on their mom i mean they they kind of miss out on i mean you can't duplicate what nature can do with, with a milk replacer so that gives them a little bit extra growth and and helps them uh, develop a little bit more But I think I gotta grab 36 because he didn't quite finish it. Third, some of them are kind of skittish still. <clears throat> Your baby. What's that? Oh, that's fine. They're sometimes they just don't want to finish their bottles. I mean, if they don't come up to me, I don't force them to come and take it. Uh, it's just that they, uh, if you, you make them eat more than they want to eat or they should eat, sometimes they get upset stomachs and then. And you got to troubleshoot from there. See, it's better to better to maybe underfeed them a little bit, just keep them a little bit hungry, so they're still wanting to come back. Because if their their bellies get too full and they can, can bloat, and then they sometimes will get diarrhea and stuff, and you got to start taking care of those problems. Is she done, Shelb? A lot of times with with new things in their environment too, it kind of sets sets them off a little bit like all right well this isn't normal and then they are kind of more apprehensive to to eat all right that's fine Are you guys all from the Springfield area originally? I'm not sure from Nebraska, but I've been in Springfield since 84. Since January for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so Mike Miller was the one who told you guys about us. Right, Mike was a, uh, a uh, an intern from Illinois College mm -hmm. this summer, and uh, he's he never really has let go of the museum. He's <laughs> doing his master's work at yeah. the UIS now. And we still see him once in a while. He comes comes over and, and does something. Yeah, he is a very unique individual. I I've had a lot of fun with him at school. We've been on several trips together. We went down the the Everglades with a professor of ours on a kayak trip down on the Turner River. Uh, went and looked at the alligators and stuff when we were like two or three feet away from great big gators there. And that river is no wider than this pen. And I mean, there's a 10 footer sitting right on the edge there and we're kayaking along like, and they didn't seem to care too much. But we can go on to the next pen real fast so that we can get a couple other shots and we can get the interview stuff. I know you guys, oh baby, I know you want sped here. Yeah, can you tell us about these again? Yeah, yeah. This group of fawns, there are, there are nine of them in here. They are all a little bit younger, and they have not been able to, uh, they're, they're in here basically because they haven't warmed up to us yet. When we bring them in from their moms, I said before, they get kind of wild and rambunctious. These guys are still kind of learning where the milk comes from, and if we put them out there in that, the big enclosure with the other ones, it would be very difficult to, to feed them all because they'd be running away and they'd be more concerned about getting away from us than finding or finding their bottle and getting fed so they're in here for that and there's actually a couple of them that are in here for a little they're a little bit older something that fawns do is they, they lick on each other and they'll like suck on each other's ears or tails just out of I mean just something to suck on and when they start doing that sometimes they can uh, they get sick so there's two of them in here that would not learn to stop sucking on each other so they got put in here to uh, kind of solitary confinement but usually about after a week and a half to two weeks in here, they, they kind of get broken of that and they can go back to being outside. And I try to rotate them. Um, a couple of these fawns this afternoon will get to go outside and run around and play for a while and then they'll come back in here. 
Because you want to make sure they're getting plenty of, plenty of exercise and they're not just laying around all day. I mean, fawns at this age, most of the time they just do lay around. And when they're in the wild, their mom comes and feeds them and they go back and lay down. They, they're not very active. They try to stay concealed and camouflaged. So they really don't need a lot of room to run up until maybe two weeks, three weeks old. And then they start following the mom around a little bit more. But this is how we usually feed them whenever, when doing in the mornings, we have these little racks that we put them all in and we can feed them all pretty quickly. Who has to fill all the bottles? What's that? Who fills all the bottles? Uh, we actually take turns. My younger brother, Steele, he uh, works at the vet clinic in the summertime. And he tried to get off today, but they're cutting hay with the, the vet clinic, so they uh, wouldn't let him off. So, I don't know, I told him that maybe if he could jet over here for a little while, because he's, I mean, he's half of all this. I mean, he, he does tons of stuff around here. And uh, I mean, he was really wanting to be here. But he's like, ah, I, I, they depend on me over there, too. So, and it, with, I mean, if the weather hadn't been what it has been, nobody's been able to cut hay until this week. So, been really, uh, really behind on that. You guys done here? Oh, uh, yeah. All right, bud. Are you going to eat any more, kiddo? All done? Yep. All righty. Yeah, if you want to do that, that'd be great. Thank you. Kevin, what are we looking at down here? What we've got here are two baskets full of pheasant eggs. Um, there's around 450 eggs there. Each day, uh, usually around 4 o'clock or so, we'll go out and gather the pheasant eggs from the breeding pheasant pens. Um, usually we pick up around 500 and 550 eggs a day. As it starts getting hotter and hotter in the summer, our egg production starts to, to wane a little bit. Um, on dry days, it is particularly nice where we can go out and the eggs are nice and clean and they just need uh, very little and we just run through and d disinfect them. Um, on the wet, muddy days, those are a big pain. This whole spring has been really rough. People have been washing close to 500 eggs a day by hand and that, uh, that takes some time and doesn't help the, the septic lines very much when you're <laughs> running that much water through. Um, well, these eggs will be gathered each day, like I said, and we'll bring them into the hatchery in here we'll go into next. And we'll put these eggs in the cooler and we usually store them up until, until we get a big group, like four, 5,000 eggs. And then we'll put them in the machine so that way we can have a big group of chicks. It'd be better, I mean, we can handle big groups of chicks like once a week rather than each day having a new group of like five or 600 that we have to, uh, have to deal with and have to clean all the equipment. So. That way we can plan each like each Tuesday it's going to be a hatching day and we'll have eggs that are hatching and more eggs that are going in than on a Friday. So if uh, you want to step in here I can show you the incubation facility. Okay, we're ready. All right. So what we're looking at here, this is one of the breeding pens for the ringneck pheasants. Um, there's close to 300 hens in here and about 30 roosters. We keep the ratio at about 1 to 10. Um, that keeps the roosters kind of occupied and gives, gives them something to, I mean, they've got their own little harems like they would out in the wild uh, of their hens that they manage. Um, and then the hens, I mean, our, it keeps our fertility high. If you have too, mu too many roosters, then you've got a lot of problems with feather picking. And you can, as you can see, I mean, no matter what you do in a facility like this, this time of year, you're going to have some feather picking problems because there are, I mean, so many birds and they're in breeding mode and the roosters are constantly fighting with each other and they're pulling feathers out of the hens as they're as they're trying to to re, or to mate with them um so we we do put a uh, i don't know if you zoom in on some of these here i see one of these here on the ground we put a uh a plastic blinder on them and i don't know if you can get a shot of that but uh what this is it's just a piece of a piece of plastic that sits on top of their beak and we run a nylon pin through that and that just pops right through both their nostrils and then it kind of sits on their face like that and what it does it it, it lowers these uh, conflicts between them because if they they got such a, a little simple brain that they don't see a threat in front of them 
then they're a little bit more calm. They don't they don't fight as much. If they don't see the other one being aggressive, they don't see that they're they're not going to be as likely to fight. So we put these blinders on them, and it keeps uh, keeps some of the fights down and and helps preserve some of the feather integrity on the birds. Um, they're kind of going through a molt right now too, so they, the birds do look a little bit rough. I'll take you up to another pin up here where the roosters are isolated, so they'll you get some good shots of some some roosters that have good feather quality. Um, what these roosters will do, we'll, uh, we'll take them in about July or August and uh, then we will move them to a bigger enclosure with a lot of vegetation and get them to re-feather out. Um, so they'll go through their molt and then they'll re-feather out so they will be back to their, uh, their old selves um, in the fall again. But this is where we're collecting those eggs from that we, we have seen. Usually we'll, we'll collect eggs once a day in, in the evening. Um, sometimes we'll go more than that two to three times a day if it's wet weather or extremely hot weather because we're like I said before you don't want that embryo to start developing um, a lot of the eggs are laid in these blue hutches around through here um, about 80% of them are and then the other 20% are laid sporadically around the pen that they just have to be picked up Yeah, they stay in here all, all year round? Or? Yes, yes, they stay around here all year round. They really don't care much for uh, being indoors. When they're indoors, they just, they just, they don't thrive. They're, they're meant to be outside. Their feathers don't do nearly as well. They, uh, I mean, they, there's more problems with them, chances of them picking up parasites and stuff when they're, when they're indoors. But yeah, they, they are kind of rough right now. I mean, they, they always are this time of year, but it's amazing you come back in August and then they have got their feathers all back. But if you guys want, I can, I'm gonna open this door, there's a little door right here and you can have a shot of one inside of one of the brooders. It's just right through here inside this and I'll come around and open it. Yeah, yeah, they start laying usually about, uh, Oh, uh, 10 o'clock or 9 to 10 o'clock the first eggs are laid and then it will be I mean, all day long until about 5 o'clock when we go out and gather. best for me to stand but you guys want to I don't sh shoot shoot okay, we're going. all right so we're inside one of the brooders right now um, this is where the chicks go after they leave the hatchery uh, there are around 2,000 fe pheasant chicks in here right now that are uh, about three days old um, this room in here, as you can see, it's not an insulated heated room. It is, uh, I mean, it's essentially just a pole barn. But these heat lights, underneath the heat lights, it, it's about 125, 130 degrees. And the chicks themselves need to be held at close to 100 degrees. They are incomplete homeotherms, I think is what it's called, where they can't control their own body temperature. And at this age in the wild, they'd be with their mother. Their, their mother would be protecting them, keeping them warm. Uh, with her own body heat and her her body temperature is like close to 100 degrees. I think a pheasant hen's like 104 degrees body temperature. Uh, it's Fahrenheit. Um, so what these chicks they need to be held at close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So what we do we hang these heat lights down here that holds it at about 125, and that way they can control their own body heat. They can go to wherever they want to in this pen to get to where they feel the most comfortable. And as you can kind of see, I don't know under some of the heat lights they're kind of scared right now since we're in here but they kind of distribute themselves evenly around the heat source so they don't get too hot and then they uh, but they don't do, get too cold and they can come out from under the these brooder covers where the heat lights are and that kind of holds the heat in and they can get food and water and they can go back in and get warm again how many do you estimate are in here right now um, there are exactly 2100 in here right now And how long will they stay in here? They will stay in this barn. Well, they're going to be in this area for about uh, two weeks. 
and then they'll get moved to the next section. As you can see, there's, we do it in different phases. Uh, there's older birds on this other side of this, and we can take a shot in here, but the thing is, when I open that door, I usually have birds fly out. Because oh. <laughs> they, uh, I gotta be very quick and, and very deliberate in my actions when I'm going in and out of it, because they, they, they see an opening and they go for it. I mean, that's a natural instinct. If they, they feel threatened, they're gonna try to escape. So, somebody's trying to call me here. Hey Jeff, can I call you right back? All right, thanks, see ya. Just shut my phone off. Now what are you feeding them exactly? Um, what this is, it is a, a it called a crumble. Um, it's soybeans, cracked corn, uh, essential amino acids, uh, vitamin mix, uh, it's got some dicalcium phosphate, I think, in it. Uh, perfectly balanced for what they would be eating in the wild, which would be insects. So it's got about a 28% protein, so it's very high protein. It's something that they need at this age to develop properly. because so They're growing really fast. They'll, they'll about double in size in, a, in about a week. And they'll continue to do that. That bird there is uh, five weeks old. So okay. you can see how fast they grow between uh, then and now. Um, but they, uh, these, this, this feed is just a, they steam, steam it and they, pe they pellet it. They have it all ground. I don't know the, the entire process, but they steam it and they pelletize it. Then they, they ground it up in this crumble that the little chicks can eat. Mm. And really as far as, I mean, having disease problems and stuff, we really don't have much problems with, uh, with diseases, I and mean, we're very, very cautious about uh, bringing other birds on the farm. We will never bring, I mean, once a bird leaves a farm, it can't come back. That's our biosecurity policy. So that way we're not running the risk of bringing something back. So we've been very fortunate on, on that end. Uh, we, do, uh, we do medicate for like coccidia and stuff in the feed. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that all poultry farmers are, are, are trying to combat is, is the spread of coccidia. Uh, we blood test our entire breeder flock every year mm -hmm. for porum typhoid, and we've also tested for uh, avian influenza in the past. Um, that's one thing. I mean, really, we're not, we're not required to test for avian just because it's, the likelihood of it being here is so slim. I mean, there's no. It's the one of concern is not even in North America. Mm -hmm. But we, we have tested for it as a importation requirement for like West Virginia and other coastal states. Mm. But we have not had any problems. Um, knock on wood, I should say. <laughs> but we, we, we feel we do a very, very good job of, of containing any problems that might arise. I mean, our only, probably our, our, I mean, our biggest threat to loss on Dale chicks like this is not like a disease or anything like that. We've never had a problem with that. It's, uh, it's, it's like mass hysteria. Mm. Um, like let's say electricity was to go off and they'd all get scared and they'd go and pile up in a corner. Mm. Like you can see that they all, like, they are huddling, like they're huddling in that back corner right now. Yeah. Um, when they get scared and a big group of them get scared, they, they can pile on top of each other and they can get, uh, they can get Suffocated, essentially. Huh. But on the on our next big step is to convert all of our electric brooders to like gas brooders. Oh, so I mean, right now the kilowatt hours it's like twelve cents a kilowatt hour, and it's killing us. So now what do you have to do, I mean, once this whole group is done in here, what do you do to clean this up? Well, one, we'll remove the bedding, okay. and we usually take that and spread it on to like a, a garden or a hay field or something that's a mulch. And then um, I usually try to let it set idle for a couple days. Mm -hmm. If it was one of the, there's, we have several rooms like this on the farm, and if it was a concrete floor, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd disinfect it, I'd squirt it out and disinfect it. This actually is a gravel base, and... Uh, you really can't disinfect gravel very easily, so we just rebed it, um, and that's what's nice about our our biosecurity policy. We're not bringing foreign birds on, so the birds that are are here were hatched here, 
so they are they have they have a natural resistance to what might be here it, as opposed to if I was to bring birds from another place and constantly keep doing that I could be bringing many many different strains of of different things that maybe some birds would be resistant to because their moms were hatched here they're I mean they've been we've been hatching the same birds without really I mean we have got I've got bought baby chicks one time with some new roosters in it to, to help uh, increase some of the genetic diversity of the flock but uh, we've been a closed flock for close to 10 years hmm. so really the resistances that we've built up on our farm are very specific to our chicks so if I mean that's something that we've we've got going for us that other farms don't they have to buy their chicks But you may want to step out of here now. Those little guys are really starting to pile up on each other back there. Unless you guys have any other questions or anything. What we've got in here is about 2,000 bobwhite quail. Um, they are four weeks old. And they are now in the final stage of our, our brooding. Uh, as you can see, there's no artificial heat. They can control their own body heat now. Their next step will be to be moved outside in the, uh, the covered pens. Um, which will probably take place in about a week. So you, what you want to do is kind of gradually break them from being dependent on the heat source. Because if you put them like cold turkey right outside, they would get scared and they'd get piled on top of each other and you'd lose some to suffocation. So we're gradually breaking them from being in like an enclosed room like you saw before with uh, a heat source and it's very warm to being in something like this where it's more open air um, it's still warm, but it's not quite as hot, and they have to kind of rely on their own own selves to keep to keep warm. Um, the what we we were looking at pheasant chicks before; these are quail, but we do it pretty much this, exactly the same way. Uh, hatching times are very very similar, so they run through our system the exact same way. The quail, we don't actually have to put a blinder on like we do the pheasants; they're not as aggressive towards each other. There are uh, there are some provisions you can take if, if problems arise. If they start feather picking, you can you can uh, take a little bit of their beak and trim it off. Um, but that's a very labor intensive thing, especially if you have to catch all these guys and and de beak them. So now, how do you get them outside? Just I'll just open those two doors, and for the first like three or four days, I'll just let them go back and forth and let them kind of find their own way. And then after a bat, I'll wait till a nice, like it's supposed to be nice weather for a couple days, and I'll push them all outside and I'll make them all stay outside. And what we'll probably start doing here at the end of next week is start squirting them off with water a little bit. Uh, that's something that we've found really, really helps keep them from. <laughs> That's something we've found really helps uh, condition their feathers to the outside weather. Is if we're they're in here and we squirt them off with water, then we can uh, <laughs> we can uh, we can condition them to be used to the rain. Because uh, birds have an oil gland at the base of their tail that they use, like you see a duck preening itself and making sure it has oil covering its feathers to make it waterproof. Quail and pheasants are the same way. They they waterproof their feathers to make sure that they uh, they don't get saturated when they get wet. How about the food? Is it the same as the? Uh, yes, at this point, it's still the same. It's still the same ration. They will be uh, in a week. They'll be being switched over to a grower formula, which is a little less protein because they they've obtained right now about 60, 70 percent of their uh, adult body mass. So their growth rate stops, not stops, but slows down to what uh, it's compared to what it was before. So they don't demand as high of proteins. So it drops from, it starts at about 28 and it will go down to about 20 on this next change. Once they hit about 16 weeks, then it will drop down to the next, which will be about a, uh, a 16 to 18% protein. But right now, I mean, usually quail are 
somewhat sexual dimorphic where you can see a difference in the males and the females. At this age, you still really can't tell a difference. The, the males have a slightly whiter mask. They don't know what to think of that flash, do they? You guys have any other questions? That's good. Thanks. Yep. Okay, Kevin, where are we now? All right, we're inside of another flight pin. And this pin is one of our grow out pins that those chicks you've, have, we've taken a look at will come out here as soon as they are ready to be exposed to the outside temperatures. Um, we're letting, you can see the cover come back and grow up. It'll grow up like, uh, like this here in about, well, about four or five weeks. And we'll go in and mow some of it down, but this will be, uh, you want there to be a, a maximum amount of cover in there for the birds so they have something to, to eat on along with. It will supplement their feed and it'll act as a, uh, a barrier to keep them from fighting so badly. Inside this pen right now at the moment, there are about 80 roosters and they're being isolated from the hens. Uh, they'll be used for my research project. I'm a, uh, in my last semester at Western, I'll be finishing my master's in biology, hopefully once I get my thesis written, is the plan. Um, but these roosters in this pen are, are gonna be used in that project. Uh, what we're doing, we're looking at a, find a, finding a correlation between sexual ornamentation, which would be like tail length, UV reflectance of specific feather patterns, uh, spur length of the roosters, which is the little bony projection on the back side of their, uh, of their heel. Um, and we're correlating that with, uh, with the, the mobility of their sperm. And so we'll be taking a sperm sample from each of the males uh, and then measuring each of these sexual ornaments and seeing if there is a, a correlation between how, how mobile each of the sperm are and how brilliantly their feathers are reflecting in the UV or how long their spurs are or how many tail feathers they're holding or retaining or the length of their tail feathers. So right now, we're, the only thing that's holding us up is we're waiting on the, the piece of equipment to analyze the mobility of the sperm. And we thought we had it secured a couple times now, but uh, it's <laughs> up to this point, we still haven't got a hold of one. Uh, I really keep my fingers crossed. I've got one more guy that's on it trying to find us one, and I think we may have found one, but it, I don't know. It, we, we may have to go ahead and do one more breeding season next summer to, uh, to actually get some good data. Uh, if you want, I can run a couple of these roosters down here. They've got really good tails and you can get some pictures of them. We got a couple rooster pheasants here. And you can kind of see the differences in their tail lengths right now. Um, I mean, some of this is mechanical because they've worked each other over a little bit. But uh, in this project, we'll be measuring tail length. And, uh, and like you can see the spur length here. Both these guys have pretty similar length spurs, but when you get down to it, they, uh, they might be several, uh, tenths of a millimeter in difference. So what do you look for when you're, when you're looking at a rooster pheasant? I mean, what is the, uh, what do you, what, what are, are the key prize things that you're looking okay, for? Okay, like what are our, like we said benchmarks before, what are, what are we trying to do? For us, 
for what our birds are designed for, we're looking at birds that are extremely flighty and extremely fast flyers and explosive off the ground. So when we're selecting our breeder flock, most of the time we select, I mean, we, we take a, a cohort of hens because we don't want to be selecting for specific traits in the hen flock where we might be picking traits that are uh, that we really aren't really trying to. So we just take a group of hens that have all been raised together, keep them together, and we use them as a, a base hen flock. The roosters, on the other hand, we're always we're picking the roosters at the long tails, the biggest, best flyers. I mean, when you look at a rooster, you're not going to use one of the ones that are kind of getting picked on and kind of are on the lower end of the, end of the social, social totem pole. You're looking for the birds that are the dominant males. And um, I mean, some, some farms are selecting for birds that are heaviest because uh, they're more designed for meat birds. All of our birds, or I'd say 90% of our birds, are for release purposes. And so they'll be turned loose uh, either for sport shooting or for dog training or restocking efforts. So our goal is to make a bird that is as similar to wild pheasant as possible. And when we're not able to like capture birds from the wild or take birds out of the wild to introduce those genes into our flock, um, so our only way of doing it is to see traits and try to select for traits that, that we like and want to uh, develop. But I mean, these are I mean, pretty good examples of uh, I mean, the roosters that we'd be producing, um, with the exception of in the fall, their tails are a little bit better. And sometimes they have got a little bit more, uh, more coloration through their saddle feathers. Sometimes you can see a little bit more blue and stuff than, than these guys that are a little bit more gray. Hmm. But you can see too that the blinders on these guys, and that keeps them from fighting so bad. You can, when you look at them head on, they can't see you. But but that's uh, that's the roosters. I'll let them go here. Now we are in uh, a pen with the adult deer. This is uh, the deer we use for urine collection. And uh, the, the deer that are around me right now, these were all bottle fawns from last year. So uh, this time last year, they were up there at the house where we were bottle feeding those fawns earlier. Um, I mean, right, these guys are just dog tame. This is what I was talking about, wanting deer that are very, very docile and easy to handle. I mean, as you can see, <laughs> they're eating the straps on the, the camera bag. and. I mean, they are, they demand attention. So it's, it's much better to handle deer that are this way. I mean, if any of them needed any vet work done on them or they needed their shots, um, that could be done a lot easier than if they were running around and trying to escape and trying to jump over the fences. So as you can see, this, this deer here, this is a one-year-old deer and he's growing a pretty nice set of antlers for being a one-year-old deer. He's, uh, the deer, these three deer here, there's a fourth one. Uh, are all from uh, artificial insemination. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, it's something they use on, on uh, a lot of livestock farms where we are like, manually breeding the does. We buy deer semen from uh, other farms and then we uh, sedate the does and we put it in the does and these guys are the result of that. So we're constantly trying to breed for uh, larger and larger antler deer. The, gen the antler genetics is what we're trying to do is build superior antler quality. Um, a lot of these, uh, these, a lot of the, the buck offspring, um, he will be used for breeding purposes, but uh, lots of the buck offspring will be used for, uh, what are they, there's these high fenced restocking areas. We have several thousand acres fenced in and they're trying to control the genetics of the deer inside these pens. They're trying to build bigger bucks. What they're trying to do is they've got these areas fenced in to keep other wild deer out and they can control this environment and say, well, we've got these deer in here. We're trying to, we're doing everything we can to grow deer with large antlers. And it's for a, a sport recreation uh, hunting industry. That's actually very, very large. You think, well, why would somebody want to pay to shoot a deer when there's hundreds of them out in the wild? Um, I mean, there's a huge demand for, for deer that have uh, superior antlers and they're the ones that are put out on these facilities and they're improving the genetics of these populations. Um, there is some demand for, uh, for deer venison. 
we've had several people contact us um, up to this point we've not really explored that avenue just because we're fulfilling our needs right now with what we have and that has not been a uh, that really has not been something that we have, have felt would benefit us but in the future that may be something that we'll end up doing But as you can see, I mean, like his antlers of a wild deer, as a one-year-old be, I mean, have a couple points and just real small. I mean, he's going to be a dandy as a one-year-old. That's his first set of antlers. And see, they still are fuzzy. So yeah, the... they will keep, keep growing out until about the end of September. They will, I mean, then they'll look like an actual deer rack, and they'll be grown up. Um, if he comes back, you can kind of feel them. They're still very, very soft. Uh, they've got blood flowing through them so they're warm uh, they actually have feeling in them they can feel it to the touch uh, and they, they're really itchy you can see he's scratching his scratching them right now but where the new cells are growing on the tips of all of them they <laughs> she's eating your tie yeah the tips of uh, the antlers are, are very very sensitive and they, they itch and he can kind of see he scratched one of them he was probably rubbing it on a tree or something and scratched a little bit on that right side but it's kind of funny, they grow, they don't always grow even. Sometimes one of them will grow a lot and the other one will grow and the other one will grow. And so it's, it's hard to say what they're gonna turn out to be until they uh, actually are done growing. For the most part, will they end up being pretty close to even then? Um, lots of times, unless some severe damage occurs. Uh, things that can c control antler development, well, one is, is, is genetics. You need to have good genetics and genetics are something that really controls a lot of the potential for antler growth. Uh, nutrition is the next thing. If You can have great genetics, but if you're not feeding them properly, they're not going to have the nutrients required to develop a, a great set of antlers. Um, and third is if they, if they have a, bod a bodily injury, uh, let's say like in the wild if they were hit by a car, they had a broken leg, um, some sort of muscle uh, damage where they wouldn't be walking correctly when they walk differently it throws off the growth of the antler sometime um, other is trauma to the antler themselves um, if the antlers get hit on a tree like he kind of scratched that there I don't think that'll be a problem but if it was severe trauma antlers can can grow different points non-typical points sometimes they stop growing um, another time where they can injure their antlers is in the, the late, late winter when they shed their shed the actual antler off their head, the, the bone part. If they shed it like maybe too soon, like they are, are hitting their head on something or and that antler falls off too soon and it takes off too much of the pedicle. The pedicle is what it, the antler grows out of. If it takes off too much, then that can cause future growth problems. Um, sometimes if you, you if you have too much of that pedicle taken off, it can leave a huge just dent in their head and they may only grow just a little bit back the next year. Um, what you're looking at, you usually want a clean break, usually maybe just a little bit of a, a saucer shape, just barely, I mean, indented at all on the top of their head. But occasionally you'll see where they take out, I mean, I mean <laughs> like that much of bone out of their head. So, here comes another one of the does. <laughs> She was one that was not bottle fed. You can see the, the difference, how nervous she is. But we can we can walk down here now and, and I can show you some of the, the other the other deer. Okay, Kevin, where are we now? Um, we're down in one of the lower pins of the on the deer the deer enclosure. Um, we got a couple of different bucks down here I wanted to show you really fast. This uh, this buck here, he's a two-year-old. He's he's one of them that I mean, we're not. You're not ever really sure what they're going to be until they they're fully grown. But um, I mean, he's got really he's just got four points showing is all, and that that's something that you really don't want. I mean, you want. I mean, he's got a lot of a lot of height and stuff, and he's not a very dominant deer as you can see. That that old doe just ran him out of here. He's uh he's kind of low on the totem pole. There's a very very hard fast social structure that they are that they are in um, in a second here we can walk down maybe just like two of us with the camera and there's one more buck down here I want to show he's the big one and I think if we all walk down there it could get everybody kinda worked up but uh 
I think if we just kind of walk down there really quietly, we can get a, a zoomed in shot of him. Should we take everybody else around the front? Yeah, yeah. If you guys just kind of hang back for a little while and then you can walk up to the fence, okay? Right. Oh, there, wait, is that, that's Jason, or that's Bronco. If, let's say, if, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, if we can walk really, really quietly along this top edge, just a couple of us, we can, we can come, in, come by here in a second. Okay, we're rolling. All right, so what we're, we're, we're looking at here now, this is, uh, this is Raider. He's a two-year-old buck. Um, he's our biggest buck we have on the farm right now. He's going to come by here pretty soon. So you can probably get a good shot at him. He, this is what we're trying to grow. I mean, at two years old, I mean, he's a trophy class animal. Um, we'll we'll use him as a breeder buck this year, and probably sell him next year with his with his third rack on. Um, so I mean, he is he is it. And this is what we're trying to grow when we're talking about trophy white-tailed deer. You take a shot down there to mom feeding one of her babies. So now you do have some fawn in here. Yes. And they're yeah. here because? Um, they're here a lot of times because they're the buck fawns, and I don't want the buck fawns to be bottle fed. Um, other ones are are in here just because they're, uh, their moms are good mothers and they can take care of them, or they're not select breedings that they'll probably end up being sold as adults, mm -hmm. so they won't, they won't be here on the farm, so I don't really need them to be tame. But the mom, you can see, is she's, she's licking the bottom of the baby. They do that to, uh, to limit the amount of smell that's, uh, that's out, so they are actually eating a lot of the manure for the baby for the first couple of weeks. Huh. And so when they're in the pens for the first two weeks, we have to rub their bottom with a, a wet like, paper towel and uh, make them go to the bathroom two to three times a day because they won't go to the bathroom on their own. Wow. Now, there's, I mean, there's no grass in here. What are they eating? Um, we feed them an uh, entirely uh, well, supplement feed in here. To get them to develop what I want, I mean, like I said, nutrition, I'd rather them be eating our ration uh, which is a pretty high protein, high calcium content ration that has uh, all the balanced vitamins and, and nutrients in it that they need. And I mean, if they had a lot of grass in here, they'd eat nothing but the grass and they wouldn't be getting an, as much protein as I wanted to give them. Um, I mean, really, probably one, I mean, our, what I'm going to be doing is opening up this pen to a larger pen later this summer. and then we'll be able to move some of the does onto a pasture setting. Um, the re one of the reasons they're kind in here is, like I said before, I like to keep them tame, so they're always coming up. So if I, if I feed them every morning, they kind of, even the, the bottle, those that are not bottle fed, kind of start learning to be more re relaxed around us. Mm -hmm. So that helps when we're, we're collecting urine off of them and when we're, uh, we're working them in the fall. But sometimes we try to get, so I've had grass growing in here three different times, but they just eat it down so fast. <laughs> and it's kind of tough, the, I mean, just the terrain here is so sloped that, mm. and it's shaded, so there's not a lot of sun, so yeah, yeah. got a couple challenges to get grass growing on it. All right, right now we're in our back pasture. Um, this is where primarily the buffalo are, the buffalo roam. Uh, th my mom rides her horses and stuff back here, but this is pretty much the buffalo pasture. There's about 20 acres here. Uh, it's all enclosed with high tensile, eight foot fence. Uh, eight foot is a little bit overkill. We'll probably have some white-tailed deer back here eventually. Uh, you can probably get by with like six foot fence for the bison, but it's very, very important you have the high tensile because they're just such a powerful animal. And, I mean, really, they don't have any reason to want to get out, so they, they stay in. Um, but you, some, I mean, some guys try to hold them back with just, just regular cattle fencing, and they've had some problems with that. If they get spooked or if they get, uh, get 
where they run out of food or they need water or something. So, but we've got, I mean, a creek that runs through here, plenty of grass, so we keep them happy and healthy here and they don't have any reason to want to test any of the fences to, to get out. Um, right over here we got, there's 14 uh, adults, I guess, or, or adults and juveniles from last year. Uh, with Buffalo, really, it's more of a laxed uh, management system. Uh, you don't have to wean the calves before the new calves are are coming on because the, the moms actually do that naturally. They're weaning the calves in uh, like the late fall that, that after, they're, after they're born. And they stay with the herd until they're probably one years old. It's, it's, about, tw it's about 12 months is when we, when we remove them from the herd and then we'll move them to be fed out. Um, so there's part of their life they spend with their moms with the next calf that's been born. And uh, the bull is left in all year long. Uh, buffalo have a it's kind of a set breeding time. Uh, like July, August, September is is the rut. Like for white-tailed deer, there's a rut. There's a rut for buffalo, and the cows all come into heat, and the bull uh, breeds most of them within a 30-day time. Like you, so you can see, these calves have all been born within the last two weeks, so they, their moms were all covered in the very, very, very close time frame. Uh, we've got one herd bull, and there's nine cows out there, and then there are uh, uh, four calves from last year uh, that are still with the herd, and then there are uh, four or five calves. I, I can't, there might have been another one born this morning. I hadn't been able to get up there and see, but there's, there's definitely four uh, young calves, and there might be five. The yeah, the bull. I think that's the, hot, the tallest hump farther back there. That's his. We can kind of go over there and get some better looks at him uh, from the gator and get some good good video of him from up close. That way we can be on the gate. Maybe you can set up the tripod and stuff on the back of the gator. We can kind of tool up there. You can film. And if they were to get agitated, we could just drive away. <laughs> how, it just depends on how daring you are feeling today. <laughs> really, there's we've not had any problems with them being overly aggressive. When you give them enough space and you don't crowd them, um, they're pretty pretty reluctant to hurt people. But if you're, when, we're, when we're working them, trying to remove calves from the herd or for, if you ever had to do any vet work to them, I mean, then you can kind of see where they can get upset. And a buffalo essentially is a cow, but it's a cow that knows how to use every inch of their body in their own defense. Uh, it's got a lot of head and a lot of horns and a lot of power up in their front end, whereas a cow, the majority of their weight is in their hindquarters. So they've got a lot of power to push through. And, uh, and we, I was moving this one cow down this big, this big chute uh, two years ago. And I don't know, it, wasn't, it was no wider than her shoulders, but somehow she ducked her head and came up under and turned around and came right back at me. And I mean, I was inches away from being, uh, being put in the dirt by her. So uh, I mean, they're they're still wild animals. They're not they're not they're not domesticated. They they get used to being around people somewhat, but they're they're not tame by any means. They're just not afraid anymore. I mean, you see those National Geographic shows of uh, that buffalo out in Yellowstone throwing that guy up in the pine tree. I always r remind myself of that when I start thinking, oh, they're not going to hurt me. They're 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 tame. They're and they're very very protective around their calves this time of year. Buffalo mothers are, are very, very great at protecting their calves from, from anything that might threaten them. And you can kind of see a lot of times, I, I don't know if this is something that buffalo actually do, that a lot of times they'll keep the calves on the inside and they'll all kind of turn out. You can kind of see how they're set up right there where the, the mom's heads are all turned out kind of towards us and the calves are more behind them. That's something that uh, I know uh, musk ox didn't do. I don't know if buffalo do that or not, but I've seen that several times when they, there's something new in the area, they're feeling threatened that they'll kind of put themselves between the calves. But uh, a buffalo is usually marketed at about a thousand pounds um, at approximately 18 to 24 months. So they're not quite as efficient as beef cattle as far as the turnaround time. You're looking 12, 14 months, I think, with a beef to get it to market weight. 
So it's about half again as long as a beef cow. Uh, but the cutability is similar. You're looking at like 55 to 60% cutability. Uh, sometimes 65 if you got a good bull. You don't castrate them. You don't need to steer them like you do beef cattle. Uh, they don't reach sexual maturity until they're two years old. So you don't have the social problems in a feedlot setting where bulls would be fighting and stuff until they would hit that two year mark and at that time they're usually marketed already. Uh, buffalo cows, they, they're heifers, they usually breed as two year olds and so they'll have their first calf as a three year old which is a year later than cows you usually breed a cow at uh, well you breed her so you want her to have her calf on her second birthday and it takes nine months gestation so it's a nine month gestation also for the buffalo and the calves grow really really fast I'd, I'd say I've never weighed one of them but I they they are when they're born they weigh somewhere around I'd say 50 pounds um, I picked one of them up one time because I had to get it it was born up in the feedlot area and I had to get it out of there so it wouldn't get get trampled by the other ones so that was an exciting day <laughs> how much do you get for meat for the cow? we sell we the way we the we way we have been marking it up to this last year we marketed on the hoof so people would buy a whole half or a quarter and we'd have a local processor process it and then they'd request what kind of cuts that they wanted so they could say I want this many t-bones this many ribeyes and the rest of it ground up into ground bison um, and we would sell that on the hoof for a dollar ten a pound and plus whatever their processing fees that uh, that they occurred there uh, right now we have just been licensed to be meat brokers so I can sell cuts individual cuts as long as they've been processed by USDA facility which over in Virginia Illinois cast meats the USDA certified facility where they can butcher bison so we can get the bison process there and we can sell if somebody wanted to say I want to buy just a pack of t-bones they can we can sell that and I've not priced any of that stuff out yet but we are now licensed to do that and we can sell the pheasants the same way as long as they're USDA processed and also the deer so that's probably our next uh, our, probably our next branch of this is to start selling some meat from the farm um, mostly through the website is what I'm probably thinking it's going to be through uh, we've had really good success with our, our web uh, web customers for, for the deer scent so I, I think I might just try to put up a new web page for wild game and see I mean really it's not you, you've got the animals already so you don't really have to you're not going to be out anything other than just the advertising costs and uh, we might start doing some of those farmers markets and stuff that they have up in Chicago and the bigger cities uh, a lot of people are very very interested right now in wild game so I think we, I mean it could be something I mean it could be nothing who knows do you have room to expand your herd if you um not on this property but I mean we we've got some more property we have about 500 or 450 acres up the road that is primarily crop ground right now but there's some t some pasture ground that could be or some alfalfa hay ground that could be made to pasture um, I mean if we were to ex want to expand the herd we'd probably need to be bu buying or leasing up some more ground because we've kind of maximized what we can do on this property yeah, this is about two weeks old. Uh, they range from about two weeks to about three days They'll, their mom will start weaning them in the late summer. So I mean, I've seen them nursing off their moms in October, and the mom is kind of starting to say, all right, it's time. And she'll kind of kick her leg forward and kind of knock its head away from her. Now when they're first born, they're born? Yeah, yeah. They, you can kind of see that they're a lot, yeah, they're not the same color as, as their parents when they're that age. And I think that probably has a lot to do with them blending into the grasses of the Great Plains uh, when, when they were really wild and it was a good camouflage. Because they're the, the same color as like a whitetail fawn, but without the spots. And that red color, you'd be surprised how well that red color even blends in with green. I don't know why. You'd think it'd stand out, but a calf that's out there, you could be walking right through something like this and that color just kind of blends into a, a natural setting.
they will start getting darker about the time that they're being weaned. Uh, as they grow their first winter coat and their hair starts changing, they'll start growing that darker, that, that, next, that next switch of their fur will be darker. So in the late summer, they'll start changing. The parents you can see are all shedding their winter fur right now still. They've got big pieces of it falling off because they got really thick, thick hair. And that's one thing that makes bison so nutritious is it is so low in fat. And the reason they can do that and still be as cold hardy as they are is, um, I've read that they've got 3,000 more hairs per square inch than a beef cow. It, and I don't, I've, I mean, I've never gotten out and counted them. I've just read that someplace. And uh, that helps insulate them to the cold a lot better than like caking fat on and being really big and 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 having that fat layer. Uh, another thing, buffalo don't have intermuscular fat. There's not marbling in a buffalo steak. There is some trim along the outsides of the cut, but there's no really intermuscular fat to speak of. So you really like to eat a lot leaner than you would be because it can dry out faster. So you just eat. I like buffalo steaks like medium rare. I mean, to medium. I mean, it's still it's, that's that's about the best way to have it. If you get it, I mean, well done, it really can dry out really quickly. So it's it's something you don't want to overcook. But buffalo are very very low in cholesterol, high in protein, high in iron. Um, it's got less less calories than skinless chicken. I think is what I what I've read. And. Uh, Native Americans, I have read, when they were on a diet of entirely bison as their principal protein source, had like zero uh, cases of cancer in their populations. That, I don't know, that's something that Texas A&M was doing some research on. Because uh, what I've read is buffalo don't get cancer. There's no buffalo, there's no cancer in, in buffalo uh, in their entire, in their entire species. that. That's the thing I've read. I mean, this is all stuff I'm going off stuff I've read. I don't, I don't know if it's true or not. Now, I've heard that buffalo are bred with cattle. Right? They are. Yeah, they're a little bit more handleable. Um, the first cross, like a 50 50 cross, is you can have some problems in that first initial cross. There's what they're, what they're called when you interbreed two species, um, they're called uh, post zygotic isolation mechanisms. And what that means is it's like nature's way of, of preventing these hybrids from being formed. Um, it's like when you breed a horse and a donkey and you get a mule, a mule is sterile. That would be an example of a post-zygotic isolation mechanism. So post-zygotic means after the zygote is formed, after the embryo is formed, this keeps this from being a new species, a new like diluted species. So with the buffalo and, and beef cows, that first generation, a lot of the males are sterile. Um, and there are some problems if you breed, I think if you breed a, a buffalo bull to beef cows, they can, they start retaining water and I think it's called hyd hydrodropsy and sometimes you'll lose the cow and the calf in that. So those are just problems that you have in the development of the 50-50 cross. Now once you got your 50-50 cross and you can breed that back to another 50-50 cross bull that was not sterile or you breed it back to 100% beef bull, then you can start getting the good uh, heat tolerant, insect resistant, uh, buffalo traits with the more docile, uh, less flighty, better converting beef characteristics. And there are guys, a lot of guys that are raising it. And I think, I mean, you can register, to register as beefalo, it has to be uh, no more buff, no more bison than three fifths. I think you can register three fifths and no more. Because they don't want the 50-50 crosses. They look like mutants too. The 50-50 crosses are are pretty pretty wild looking. <laughs> well, they've got kind of kind of a, a cow head, and they got the the the, the, the buffalo hump. Um, they've got they some they do have horns a lot of times. Um, I mean, they've got different colors. I've seen one that was a half Holstein, half buffalo. So it was like black and white, and it had the Real, I mean, more shifted weight to the front, more so than the hindquarters. Um, they, I've, I've never really been around one a ton. I mean, just like been like around it. Uh, I mean, other than at, like auctions and stuff. So I don't know like their behavior. If their behavior is different. Now you 
you're over here what, what amount of cows are We have nine cows and one bull, and then there are four juveniles from last year. Um, we had four calves now that have been born this year, and we should have, I mean, if, if everything goes right, we should have five more calves on the way. So. How much cattle is there? Oh, in the, this herd here? 100% American bison. Oh, really? Yes. These are 100% American Plains bison that you have not been diluted one bit from, from to beef. Um, and that is really because we, we are wanting to get the nutritional facts from, factors from buffalo. Uh, when you start mixing it with beef, it starts going more towards what beef is. And beef is, I mean, it's, it's really tasty, but it's not always the healthiest uh, meat because of the cholesterol and, and the fat content. So we are really, really trying to keep our herd pure so we can get the benefits of that nutritional, the nutritional benefits from that. Um, we will, when we start keeping more of our heifer calves back, if we do expand our herd, we'll have to get a new bull so we're not breeding back closely. One thing with bison, um, everybody knows there used to be like 30 million bison roaming the prairie and their population went through a bottleneck and it ended up being like 300 buffalo left in entire North America. And so their genetic diversity got really, really low. So that's a problem that everybody with buffalo is, is fighting because buffalo are already kind of inbred because there were so many, I mean, these populations that were left were brothers and sisters and cousins and fathers being mated back and forth trying to expand the population. So you want to try to find a herd that is unrelated that you're going to, if you're going to introduce a new animal. And um, I mean, if we were to, we'd probably, we'll get a new bull in the next couple of years uh, so we can start keeping back some of our heifer calves. Uh, one thing you got you got to be really careful with is sometimes the bull can be very very aggressive. We've been fortunate enough to have a bull that's not. Um, he kind of hangs, just kind of hangs out, just kind of, and it kind of makes the whole herd a little bit more calm. But if he was more aggressive, then we'd have some more issues we'd have to deal with. Uh, another thing you have to watch out for is if you're getting buffalo from out west is uh, tuberculosis, uh, brucellosis. Uh, and several other diseases, so I mean, we, we really are reluctant to introduce any new stock if we don't have to from another state. Um, but then again, if you're buying them from Illinois, you might, might bring it to a close relative because the population in Illinois is kind of just getting switched around to different farms. So um, you'd want to buy from uh, tested herds and make sure everybody's accredited and, and tested for any disease that might be present. But um, uh, like I said before, we've never had a problem with any diseases in our herd because we do keep a closed herd. What's the name of your bull now? Well, his original name was Cody, but we changed it to Pig because he sits in front of that hay ring from about September to May and just eats and eats and eats and eats and eats. And he doesn't even leave it. And so he got dubbed pig because he just eats like a pig. <laughs> so you are supplementing the food that they got. Yes, we are, we are giving them uh, alfalfa hay pretty much year round to supplement the, the pasture. Uh, we've, they've got 20 acres and there's plenty of vegetation out here. And we have had just done that just so they don't work the pasture over too much. And last year with the drought we had, the pasture wasn't nearly as nice as it is now. So um, we do supplement feed. You don't really want to supplement much grain to your cow herd because if, especially when they're pregnant, because if they're getting too much nutrition, the calves can get too big inside of them. You can have some calving problems uh, if you're on too high of a plane of nutrition. But on the lower, uh, I mean, buffalo are very good at converting low energy or low nutritional value food into to energy. So like prairie hay, if you had a good access to like blue stem and all the native stuff that they were eating whenever they're on the prairie, that's a great source of nutrition for them. So they're better at, I, I would say that they're better at converting low, low nutritional roughage into protein gain than a beef cow, but they require a lot more volume to do it and more time. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to their um, insect uh, repellent. Uh, they get that dust on them, and I think it kind of helps keep the bugs off of them, just rolling around in that. 
and I mean, you hear a buffalo wallows and stuff. Where I mean, they'll go down in these these creeks down here and roll around in the mud, and they'll be caked in mud sometimes in the hot part of the, the summer. Um, their their hide's pretty thick too, so bugs don't bother them quite as bad as a beef cow. But yeah, they do always like to dust themselves. Then they've got that area kind of scraped out there, and they're always rolling around in it and, and dusting themselves. No, they're they're all over the place. Like, there's another spot where in the, like the in the evening that they're kind of more out in that area. There's several spots. Usually at about sundown, they're in that corner. Um, I don't know. I don't see them in this this area as much. In the early morning, they're usually down in the valley along that hillside. Uh, kind of like gets still in the shade in the in the morning where they're still feeding. Um, in the early early morning, right when the sun's come up, usually they're up at the up at the lot eating on some hay when there's so yeah, they're they're all over the place in here. But if if you want, we can put the camera in the back of the gator and and drive over there and. Oh, okay. Yeah, you'd never want to get them separated. If you got some in one area, you don't want some in another because they they like being together in a herd. So they'll they'll panic if they get separated. So you don't want them ever to have one that gets away from the herd. But yeah, we can kind of sneak up over here and see uh, if we can get a better shot of one from up close. Hopefully nothing goes awry. Yeah, yep, that's the big bull right there. He probably weighs somewhere around 1,800 pounds, and he's a, a four and a half year old bull. Or I guess he's, I guess he's five now. Yeah, when you talk about uh, recruiting another bull, mm -hmm. uh, how do you go, go about recruiting another bull? Well, when we would do something like that, or if we decide to do something like that, we'd contact several other buffalo farmers and see what they have available. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, what something might might consider is like switch, sw switching a bull from our herd to theirs. Um, so that way we're changing some of the genetics. Um, we're, when we're looking for a bull, you're looking for one that's obviously large for his age. Um, he's got a good body conformation, sound feet and legs. Uh, you want them to, to have wide hindquarters. Um, something that with a lot of buffalo you can see is they, they kind of got a really narrow rump and you're wanting more muscle in the rump, so you're looking to uh, to maximize the amount of meat you can produce on buffalo. So you're looking to breed of the buffalo that has superior muscling. So you want to find one that's a, a thicker bull. One thing we've noticed too, there's kind of two two types of buffalo. That it's really not documented, but there's it seems to be like there's the nickel buffalo, like the ones you see on the back of a, of a five cent piece, that kind of has the, the skinny butt, and then there's the, the black buffalo that are more massive and big and, and thick and he would be considered a black bull. He's got more black features and, and black more black tint to his color than some of the cows in the herd here mm -hmm. and the black ones seem to have a, a thicker a thicker more solid build. And if you want we can drive over there maybe and get him to stand up. Okay.
I don't really want to shut off the motor just in case he decides to come this way, but uh, if you can still hear me, he, you can see he's very, very sound in his hindquarters. He's very thick in his hindquarters. And you can see the bugs, really the only place the bugs bother them is around their eyes because their skin is so thick and their hair is so thick that they really can't penetrate them very well. When he was a, uh, a one-year-old, and we, we had him separated with the other one-year-olds, I threw a big bale of hay into his pen, and he came up and started eating on it while I was trying to take the wires off. And I kind of rolled it away from him, and he lunged at me and tried to jump at me like he was like, hey, don't take my food away. And uh, I punched him in the nose as he did it. And he never has really, has really given us too much of a problem after that. Now, he doesn't like my brother very much. My brother, uh, there's a group of them, and it was a really hot day, and he thought he'd squirt them with the hose and get them kind of cooled off, and he hated it, and he's never forgot it. He kind of looks, he kind of is more aggressive towards my brother. You're getting a tight spot, you're just punching in the nose. Right? Well, I don't know if that's uh, recommended, but it seemed to work that day. He was a lot younger. He was a... Uh, and he was like these other ones here. I mean, you can see when they're this age, the one-year-olds, 